أرسلك وأنت الأسماء نأمل عفوك سبحانك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So we've gone through some of the names of Allah Azza wa Jal and we are up to the name Al-Jabbar So هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو كون الرحمن الرحيم الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر so today inshallah we will cover Jab- we'll come out to jabbar and hopefully we'll cover uh, his his great name mutakabbir as well <coughs> now the name jabbar jabbar it is a name that has occurred in Surah Al-Hashr uh, and it's also a name that has come in a hadith and if you if you look in a hadith you will find it has been used in two ways one or, or in the Quran one is that Allah Azza wa Jal he refers him to, his, him, to himself as Al-Jabbar and in a hadith <coughs> or hadith Qudsi if Allah Azza wa Jal is addressing someone and saying you are a, you are Jabbar or, or something like that, it's in a negative sense. For Allah to be Jabbar which means mighty, which means powerful, which means one who, who can coerce others into things, who can make others do things, who can put things right and so on. There are many meanings we're going to come to. It is positive, which means Allah Azza wa Jal has the right to do all of these things. But if the son of Adam becomes Jabbar, tries to become mighty, tries to become a tyrant or someone who's trying to exercise his power, then that is negative. That is why in hadith, in Bayhaqi, is reported that, uh, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, In Allah azza wa jal idha kana yawmul qiyamah, when the day of judgment will actually come, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jama'a Allahu samawati sab'i wal ardi. Allah will take within his, his grip or Allah will put together, He will bring together all the seven heavens and the seven earths fi qabdatihi, within His power, within His grip, however you want to put it. Allah Azza wa Jalla will bring it together. Then He will say, An Allah, I am Allah. An Rahman, I am the most merciful. An Al- and Al Malik, I am the King. And Al Quddus, and Al Salam, and Al Mu'min, and Al Muhaymin, and Al Aziz. I am Aziz. I am. Jab- I, I am this. And then in, in the end, he will say, An Al Jabbar, I am the Mighty One. An Al Mutakabbir, I am the One who has the right to show His greatness over others. An Al Ladi Badatu Dunya, I am the One who has started the creation of this world. وَلَمْ تَكُ شَيْئًا When it was nothing, وَأَنَا الَّذِي أَعْدَدْتُهَا I am the one, I am the one who has, who has prepared all of this. And أَيْنَ الْمُلُوكَ Allah then follows on by saying, أَيْنَ الْمُلُوكَ Where are the kings? أَيْنَ الْجَبَابِرَ Where are those mighty ones? Where are those kings of the world? And where are the mighty ones? The ones who are tyrants, the ones who are... Who, who used to show their might over others, who used to coerce others to do things and so on, where are they? So this hadith clearly shows that it's, you know, if it's used in the, in the sense where Allah uses it for Himself, it is positive, and if He uses it for any of His servants, then it is negative, meaning that He is not pleased with the fact that someone is Jabbar, or someone is trying to show His might. In, in the Qur'an, Surah Al-Shu'ara, 26 surah verse number 130 Allah says wa idha batashtum batashtum jabbarin now this is about the people of ad the giants and sayyiduna hud alayhi salam is giving them da'wa and he's telling them to be humble and he's saying that when you actually traverse the earth and when you actually go to others then and you try and tr- try and get hold of them you take hold of them with great might and power in the sense that you, you kill them. 
Because these were giants, and that's how they used to be that other, others who were smaller than them, or others who were uh, of their own size, which they had a fight with, an argument with, they, it would just end up in killing and in murder. So again, the word Jabbarin has been used in this, in this ayah. Now, in Arabic, you have also, it, with the with this root letters of Jabbar, which is Jim, Ba, Ra, you have the meaning of making two things that are broken be mended and for them to be for, for, for you to be the mender and for it to be mended so for example if if you find something like a bone and you're able to put the put the two bones together and mend it as one piece then you have just put it together and it has mended this Obviously, Allah Azza wa is the one who is Jabbar in the sense that He can mend things. This this can also be a meaning that Jabbar can hold, which is He is the mender or the one that puts right things that are broken. Okay? And this this type of meaning can be used for for others as well, but mainly it will be used for Allah Azza wa And there is a there is a, a, a poet who says, "Qad Jabbar Dina al Ilahu Fajabar." Allah is the one who will mend the religion when it's broken and therefore the religion will be in one piece again. This is, this is Allah's way of doing things and it, it, it has his, his, um, his quality of being able to do things that others are not able to do. Now this, this thing of mending the religion, what does it mean? It means that he has, he, he gives it, he gives it extra might He's the one that gives the religion an extra might. He will give it an extra support. He will make his religion become dominant over other religions. Uh, and therefore, he has given a strength to his religion on the earth that it never had before. This is one of the meanings of Jabbar. This is one of the meanings of Jabbar. Jabiruddin or Jabbaruddin, he's the one that can bring uh, a power, give a power and a might and a strength to the deen, to the religion, which it never had before. Now when it's used for the, uh, used for a human being, what it means that the human being has gone past the limits of Allah. He has gone beyond the boundaries of Allah. He has become strong, stern, stubborn, or someone who is now committing injustice. <coughs> committing injustice. So this normally happens either by kings, kings who's, who think that you know they're, they're on top of everything, no one is above them, or it can be with anyone who believes that the truth is is you know the truth is beyond them or, or, or that they're above the truth, they're above the truth, they don't need the truth, either because Allah Azza wa Jalla has given them a whole amount of reason for them to believe that they are proud. And they, they can have this, this attitude with others. For example, when Allah gives people a lot of money, a lot of money, it can sometimes turn a person into a Jabbar, into a tyrant person. Um, when Allah gives a person some, let's, let's say some dignity that they found when they were born, like you know, they were born as a prince, or they were born into a royal family, or they were born into a very important family, or one that has great honor. It can turn certain individuals amongst them to become tyrants. Now it doesn't have to be, but it's that person who has chosen to be like that. So what they do, what they do is, they will defy the truth. When the truth comes, they will sort of snort at it and think, well, you know, I don't have to accept that. I don't have to do that. So they will they will then cross the boundaries of Allah and start to commit zulm, which is oppression. And this is something which we have seen. Um, and, and and they will not they will not become humble in front of the truth. See, this obviously is happening with someone who's doing this to a high level, but it can happen with us as well, doing it in a small level. For example, you've done something wrong, or you know there's a political situation in your own house, or it could be in your own job, or it could be in your own social sort of friends, and you said something which you shouldn't have said. You did something which you shouldn't have done. And then arises a situation that you're supposed to, now you're aware of your guilt. 
you, you know deep inside that I shouldn't have said that. I'm the one that started that. I'm the one that created all of this. My action really led to all of this. And you realize that, that it's, it's you who's the, who's the problem. And others around you are now beginning to point at you and now they're convinced that you're the one. You need to bow your head down to the truth and say, guys, it's my fault. Now at that time, if you do say that you know, it's my fault, then you are a mutawadir. You are a person who is humble. And you've proven that. And it's not easy to do that. Especially, the, especially when the, the greater the matter, the greater the matter, the more difficult it is for people to give in to the truth. Because the greater the embarrassment. You know, like, I just one thing that comes to my mind right now is the whole controversy of the news of the world. You know, news of the world? The whole controversy, yeah? <laughs> Stretching over one whole year now in the, in the media with the, with the courts. If you actually think about it, the amount of people that are lying. And these are big officials, <laughs> you know. These are, so, these are MPs involved, you know, police officers. We're talking about... Uh, chief, you know, superintendent police, you're talking about media giants that are involved, people who are shaking hands and sitting and standing with the MPs and the prime minister, in fact, right? People from his cabinet, right? And you think, because the thing is, the, the embarrassment that they will get will be a, will be a lifetime embarrassment. They'll never be able to come back up from it. But you're in a position already that you have had a lot of responsibility in that position. And you've got to be careful now. They were doing this for years. Imagine six years they've been tapping into people's phones, um, finding out where they're going, making money because they're making media news, sending the paparazzi around to them. And they're, and they're surprised. How did the paparazzi know that I'm here? And they've been tapping on their phones, they're, you know, getting their messages, their voicemails, finding out what kind of meetings they've got, okay? And they've been doing it for six years to the extent, to the extent that it is quite clear, it is quite clear um, that, that inside, people inside who have, who have given out, you know, they've, they've brought out the, the, um, the, the inside story that this is happening. It's a big, big embarrassment. And for them now to carry on sort of putting things under the carpet, and now the people, you know, the, 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 the force is now moving the rug and seeing what's underneath it. And now Miss Brooks and others who are having to give, you know, they're giving, they're giving the testimony and now they're tracking back things. The how come hang on a minute, you said this here, you said that there. And it's, you know, they're still having to, once you start lying, See, the problem is once you lie in the beginning, you have to lie again to hide that lie. But when you make the second lie, you have to make a third and a fourth lie to protect the first and the second lie. And when you carry on doing that, the more lies you make, the more you, rope you tie around your own neck or you give to others to tie around your neck because you're going to get caught one day. <laughs> See, if it was a simple one lie, then you've got less chance of being caught. But if your lie extends to 10 lies, 20 lies, and further lies to cover the original lie, then you're really having to dig yourself a, you know, a sand pit and say, goodbye guys, I mean, <laughs> I'm drowning in here. So, what I'm saying is that when you're in your own situation, when you're in your own situation, we come across these things that Allah tests you. And He tests to see what you're going to do now? If you carry on starting to become this arrogant type of person, I say, no, I don't care. I don't care. So what? I did it. And that's deep inside. Whether you admit that to people or not. You know, some, the, the worst of people, what they'll do is, you know, they, they'll keep it all within themselves. And some people, what they'll do is, they'll admit it to someone. Even a close friend, they'll admit it. But some others will eventually come out with it. But the one who's the best one is that he'll put his hands up and he'll say, you know what, it's my fault, I'm in the wrong. And Allah will praise that person for that. Allah will appreciate that person for what they've done. 
if the, if they can put their hands down and say, you know, I am a person who's who's done the wrong. Allah loves that. But if the person becomes argumentative, arrogant, even going to tyranny, which is that now they're going to say, okay, you want you want to catch me? You want to catch, you think I did something wrong? You think that? You think that? Okay. I'll show you, I'll prove it to you. So then now what they do is, they start to make life difficult for the people who are trying to catch them. That is a real Jabbar. That is Jabbar. A person who's tried to catch, you know, make life difficult for them. I mean, what wrong did they do? They're trying to just find the truth. And you're a person who's become arrogant, not admitting to the truth, and now you're playing games with them, and making life, their life difficult. This is, these are the types of people Allah will call on their and say, where are they? Where are they? Come in front of me now, and I will take you to task. Um, so, you, you've got that. Now they say that um, Walid bin Yazid ibn Abdul Malik, who's one of the kings in the past, he took the Quran one day. He was a tyrant king, and he took the Quran one day, and he said, "Okay, let me look in the Quran, and let me see, let me see what Allah would have, you know, thinks of me." Uh, so this is called. This is known as Tafa'ul Bil Kitab. You know, you take the Quran and you say, Look, let me just open the Quran anyway. And wherever my, my eyes fall onto whatever ayah, I, I can take it as a sign from God that is telling me something. Now, this is obviously not something which, which is in the Sunnah, but you know, people now and again, when they, when they want to do, do that, and in this case, it's a tyrant who's doing it, but normally when a purpose person is desperate, and they do that, it's up to them. If they find some meaning and they go with it, that's up to them for the whatever meaning they take, but it's not in the Sunnah, it's not in the Quran to do this. So, Walid, uh, Walid bin Yazid bin Abd Malik did that. And he took it and, and in his, in his um, hand. And he looked at an ayah in the Qur'an and it was, it was in Surah Ibrahim, verse number 15. Surah number 14, verse number 15. Which says, وَاسْتَفْتَحُوا وَخَابَ كُلُّ جَبَّارٍ عَنِيدٍ Allah is saying that, you know, my, my, my people who are the believers, they sought help from me. And every tyrant who was, who was stubborn on the ground, they perished and they came to an end and they lost. When my believers called on me, made dua to me, and I came to their rescue, then I crushed every tyrant and every stubborn one on the earth. When he read this, he said a poem. He said, this, this, this Walid, Walid bin Yazid ibn Abdul Malik. What he did is he, he, took, he, he took a, um, he said a poem, he said, أَتَوَعَدَ كُلُّ جَبَّارٍ عَنِيدٍ هَا أَنَا ذَاكْ جَبَّارٌ عَنِيدٍ نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ He said, what? Every tyrant, every stubborn one, well here I am. I am the tyrant, I am the stubborn one. إِذَا مَا جِئْتُ, إذا, إذا ما جئت رَبَّكْ يَوْمَ حَشْرٍ نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ He said this, he said that, when I come to your Lord on the day of, of resurrection, فَقُلْ يَا رَبِّي مَزَّقَنِ الْوَلِيدِ Then you go and tell your Lord that Walid, he ripped your Lord apart. Now, this is, a, this is a tyrant on the ground who's saying this about Allah Azza wa And they say that within days, within days he was killed. He was assassinated. And then, you know, by his own people, he was assassinated. And then they hung him. On, within his palace they hung him and his whole people saw his body, dead body, hung on the, uh, you know, on, his, on a place of his palace that the people or his crowds could actually see him. And subhanAllah, when Allah wants to crush someone, He will crush someone. See, when they, when they built the Titanic, I don't know if you know this, but when they built the Titanic and they're going to sail from Liverpool to New York, and they're making this journey. The one of the ones who made the Titanic said, you know, was 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 asked in an interview just before they left Liverpool. He was he was asked, you know, do you think this 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 sink can ship this whole ship can actually sink in the in the ocean? And you know what he said? This Jabbar, this tyrant said. He said that even if God wanted to sink it, he he couldn't sink it. This is, this is in their the record, this is in their media, this is in, you dig it up, you'll find it. 1915, 
was the was the year. It was in 1912. Sorry, 1912 was the year. He said, if he, even if God wanted to sink it, he wouldn't be able to sink it. So they went. They went on this cruise liner, the ship, and they sailed across, and they got somewhere near to the, you know, on the Pacific side, and, you know, it was night time, they were all having a wonderful time on the ship, and they're all sort of, you know, these are the wealthiest people who can afford this. Can you imagine? <laughs> they're the wealthiest people who can afford this. And the luxuries on this Titanic, there is nothing like this in the world. And they move in the night time when the and Allah will make them do this. See, Allah will make them do this. If you wanna you wanna challenge the the Jabbar, the real Al Jabbar, you wanna challenge him, then he will show you, he'll break you. So they challenged him. So Allah said, Okay, you wanna do that? I've got your hearts in my hand. <laughs> I will make you do things that you will think later, uh oh, what did I do there? I will make you do it. So what happened is this night time, it's, you know, a head is a bit of mist, right? A head is mist. And they all know that in this freezing weather, there can be icebergs that are, you know, very, they're like mountains in the, on the, from the seabed that rise up. They know this. But Allah's got their hearts in His hand. So He makes the sailor of this ship Say, nah, don't worry. Ah, you guys have a nice time. Don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry. Titanic. What's an iceberg going to do to Titanic? An iceberg. We'll break. The, I mean, he's thinking what? He's thinking, if I put, if I go ahead, I'll go slowly. But if I just go ahead, and if I hit an iceberg, this thing's so big, it's going to break the tip of the iceberg. That's what went in his head. Allah made him believe that. He said, yes. <laughs> He's playing with the Jabbar. They're all playing with the Al-Jabbar. So they went ahead in the night time. And it, it came across and it hit. And you know, before he went ahead, some of his other sailors said to him, you know, it's not safe. I read about this. I read a whole article about this. They said to him, it's not safe. And he said, he said don't worry. What can happen? Don't worry. Right? So he went ahead. And it was a very sharp iceberg that they hit. And that, you, you want to play with Allah, okay, you play with Allah now. And that iceberg, not, they hit it and they don't realize what they did. Is that it actually acts as a knife of Allah. Allah says, okay, you want to you 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 challenge me? Okay, here, slit. I will slice the bottom of your Titanic. So Allah sliced it. They sliced into it. And then after a little while, you know, it's like, they're still playing their music and they're enjoying themselves and some are asleep and whatever the chefs are cooking. <laughs> and the next minute they know, the sailor says, we're going down. We're going down. You know what? You know if you look at the, what happened to the Titanic, <clears throat> subhanAllah, you know when Allah wants to show someone His power. See the Titanic, imagine, imagine I've, got the, um, I've, I've got one end of the Titanic, so it's, it's, it's like a, a large sort of boat shape here, okay? What happened is that they built this Titanic so strong that they believed that it couldn't snap. One of the theories was this type, it can't snap. You, and they believed that it couldn't be, you know, you couldn't take it down the ocean. So when Allah put, He sliced this side of the Titanic, and the water, to st water started to come inside here. Okay? What's happening now is that it's getting heavy here. Heavier and heavier. And this part of the boat, the other side of the boat, is now lifting. So Allah wanted to show them who is Al-Jabbar. Right? So this is now in the water, that's above the water. And it got so high that in the middle it snapped. Allah snapped it, broke it in half. And then He allowed the two pieces to fall down. But then what does Al-Jabbar do? He allows people in that freezing cold weather. See, He could have snapped this, He could have snapped this in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But who would have lived to tell the story? Tell me, who would have lived to tell the story? No one. No one. When Allah gets a, when Allah gets a tyrant on the earth, He's going to make sure that people are around to talk about the story. 
when he took Qarun down, so Qarun was another Jabbar, Qarun was another Jabbar, a tyrant, a mighty one, thought that he had it all in his hands, and so on, you know, I'll get down to that, but when he, when he snaps someone in half, he will make sure that people are there to tell the story, and subhanAllah, Allah made them, you know, he made the snap near enough for them to get rescue, and for many people to live, you know, many drowned, but there were others that were li- who lived, and they lived <coughs> with a face of fear and humbleness to tell the story of what Allah did to them. They lived to tell that story. They had 24 lifeboats on that thing, and it was, it was, it was too less. It was too less for them. But Allah allowed them with their lifeboats to get back to the shore. And those people till today, they told a story over one century. All the people who lived, they told stories to their children and their children told their st- that story to their children. And Allah showed them who Al-Jabbar is, who the real mighty one is. And subhanAllah and azim you know, after, and, and then what does Allah do? Allah makes them go back and He makes them discover it. They've gone back down there, they've discovered it. And they've seen the ruins and the remains. What is it? Where, 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 where is that guy who made that statement now, that even if God wanted to sink the ship, he, he couldn't even sink it? Where, where is that guy now? So now they've got remains, you know, the fish have just eaten the, they're eating the mold that's growing off on the ship on the bottom of the seabed. That's what Allah's made of it. And this is Allah saying to all the rest of mankind, don't challenge me. Don't challenge me. See, one of the things they say, Allah, I don't know about this one, but they say that you know the, in 1986, when seven astronauts, they died in a NASA spaceship um, that, that took off. It was called the Challenger. It was called the Challenger. Why did they call it the Challenger? Who were they challenging? They were challenging God. That's what, Allah Alam, if this is true or not, who they were challenging, but the story goes that they were challenging God. Why? Because they wanted to do something, subhanAllah, you know, Allah, Allah he, he forbade zina on the earth. He forbade zina, adultery on the earth. They wanted to do adultery in the sky. Amongst those space men, there was a woman, space woman. And they want to take her up, and they wanted a spaceman to commit adultery with her in space. If imagine people with money, with power, with, with might, whatever, what they get to. So Allah thought, what well, you you want to challenge me? If this is true, you want to challenge me? Then okay, lift off. <laughs> Come, I'll show you. <laughs> lift off. So they lift off within seconds. Within seconds, boom, a fire caught at the bottom of the engine, and that was it. Who you challenge? Who? How can you challenge Allah Azza wa Jal? That Qarun is another great example in the Quran. You know, he came. You know, he was he was a real tyrant, a mutakabbir, one who had his arrogance. And he was a person who wanted to show off his might. Now, Allah, you know what Allah does is, many of these Jabbars and these other tyrants and mutakabin, Allah will take them out on their best day. They're, they think that they've reached their height, that they, it cannot get any better than this. The people are giving them admiration, it cannot get better than this. Allah will take them to that day. To that time, to that moment, when all is the best for them. And the, the heart is, you know, they are thrilled with the enjoyment they're getting. The reception of people's, you know, uh, waves to them. And you know, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you're the one, you're the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wish I was like you. I wish I was like you. And they can, that's me. You know, the guy's filled with it. Allah will take him on that day and then he's going to crush him. So what did Allah do with Harun? <coughs> Harun used to be one who used to show off. You know, his keys. And his keys, you know, your keys, you can keep your keys in a big treasure place. You know, you can secure them in a big safe. Harun had the might to make a massive safe and to lock his keys. But Harun didn't want to do that. Harun was 
Jabbar, you know, he wanted to show his might and his power and flex his muscles. So what he did is, wherever he went, there were ten strong men with, you know, you talk about built men that could carry and lift. Ten of them followed him, just carrying his keys. The amount of keys he had, he had a lot of treasures, a lot of treasures. And ten men, can you imagine the amount of keys they're carrying? They're, they're finding it heavy to carry these keys. And their job was just to carry these keys. You know, ding, 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 ding. Imagine ten of them following him wherever he's going, all right? And they've got all these keys all around them. And, you know, they're carrying them. And they, Allah said, لَتَنُوُوا بِالْعُسْبَ الْقُوَى Allah said that even these ten men, they're finding it difficult to carry these keys. That's how many treasures Allah gave him. But he wanted to show them off. So what happens is that, you know, he's a, he's a big show off. He, whenever he comes uh, out, he never wears the same clothes again. Right, and these are the most expensive clothes you can get. And so, what he did one, and he had so many horses, he had so many of his own soldiers, so many bodyguards, so many palaces, so many treasures. You know, it's un- unthinkable how much Allah had given him. So, what happened is there was a day. You know, like we have, we have. Uh, you know, in this country, you don't feel the Eid. You know, Eid, you don't feel it. In our countries, you feel the Eid. You know, in our own countries. Have you been in our own countries for Eid? Yes? The whole, when the whole country is celebrating Eid, yeah? you can feel it. Because everywhere you go, there's, there's everyone smiling and everyone's coming out. And especially when you go to the center of the city. The center of the city, when they're going to have their, their Eid, then, you know, there's a lot of... Everyone's wearing new clothes. Everyone's smiling. Everyone's giving, you know, something out. Everyone's received gifts. Everyone's got a nice pair of shoes. Everyone's happy on that day. And there's a lot of people. All right? We're talking about thousands and thousands of people, especially when you go to the, the, to the great, the, the big mosque in the, in, the, in the city. So this is known as Yawm Zina. This is the day of decoration, which, you know, all countries have, right? So what did Qarun do? Qarun said he's going to come out. He was going to come out on the day of his Eid, in his, in his time, whatever that was. Okay, He's going to come out on that day when all people are out in their nicest clothes. He's going to come out with his nicest clothes. So he came out, he, you know, when they brought him his clothes, he said, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. You know, he spent a long time, even he had people choosing for him his best clothes. So he chose his best clothing. Then he said, out of all his horses, he had hundreds of horses. So he went through his horses and said, that one there, the one that is the whitest horse, that people when they look at it, they're going to say, wow. Yeah? They decorated that horse. They decorated him. So he got onto his horse. And then he said, you know, my soldiers, he wants the best of his soldiers. And they're going to march right behind him. Now there are those ten men somewhere with, his, with all the keys. All right? And they, he said, you know what? He said, bring all my treasures out as well. Today, you know, I want to show them what I've got. So all my gold... My silver, my merchandise, my you know, things I've collected. I want you to bring them out, my soldiers to carry them. And they're going to be in there in a way that all people, when I pass by them, they're going to look gobsmacking at the amount of treasures I've got. So now this is not normal for a person to do. Who's controlling his heart? Come on guys. Allah is controlling He's going to bring out his treasures. Which tyrant ever does that? Which, which, tyrant, you know, which tyrant ever does that? But he's going to bring, so he's brought, bring out all his treasures out. So you can see, my God, the pearls and the rubies and the diamonds and the, and the amount of gold and the different shapes. And you, 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 you know, what happened? When he came out in a parade, he said, I'm going to parade down the whole city. And when he paraded, the people looked at him. And the people of this world, يُرِيدُونَ الْحَيَاةَ dunya. The people who wanted this world, this, they liked to have this world. They said, they looked at all of this and they said, Ya laita lana mithla ma utiya Qarun. If only we had been given what Qarun has been given. They wished for that. So Allah made them wish for it. So Allah, Allah brought all the people now. Imagine the whole city is here. The whole city is here. And all types of people, you've got the, you've got the yuridun al hayat al dunya, the people who want to, who want to gain this earth. And you've also got those people who, um, who are the people of, of knowledge, right? They said no. They said what I'll, you know, the, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ وَيْلَكُمْ 
They said, no, 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 what are you doing? Woe to you. Don't, don't you know, ask for this. Whatever Allah has given it is enough. Whatever Allah has given is enough. Don't wish for whatever every... You know, they knew that he was a mutakabbir, he was an t- arrogant tyrant who, who thought that he was it. And he used to play with people, whatever games he wanted, because he had power, he had might. And the great uh, Fir'aun, he was, you know, he, he was his friend. Fir'aun was his friend. You know, the pharaohs, the whole, they were friends. You know, they basically, if anyone touched him, he gonna tell his mate Fir'aun, and you forget it. He, your history mate, he'll make you a slave if you has to. So no one messed with Qarun. This was the, you know, this was the ultimate tyrant that Allah took out as an example of Quran. So what happened is that when when he came out with all of this, and people were looking in amazement of how much he's got. People were on one side. And other people on another side, and right in between is his parade. And when he got to his highest, and he thought, wow, this is who I am. فَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِ Suddenly, Allah Azza wa Jal told the earth, my earth, swallow him in right now. Swallow him in, in front of all these people. So the earth suddenly swallowed him, all his soldiers, all his keys, all his treasures, and even his palace behind, Allah swallowed that in the earth. All of it swallowed, all of it, and the people were left there, right? Some people had run away, but then they thought, well, no, no, hang on a minute. It's just swallowed him, just his soldiers, just his palace. And then the earth came back together. As if nothing happened. And they were absolutely gobsmacked. And Allah showed them, the people and Qarun, who Al-Jabbar is, who are the mighty one is. And this is Al-Jabbar, you know, you don't, no one messes with, with Allah. You know, if you think, if you think these kings, you know, the, the kings in our time, yeah, or the presidents or the corrupted ones in our time, if you think they're doing bad, they're doing nothing. Yeah, they're doing nothing, honestly, they're doing nothing compared to Fir'aun. You know the examples in the Qur'an? If you ever take the examples of the Qur'an and you compare them with anyone else ever after until the Day of Judgment, no one would have got to what they've got to. And you look, talk about Ad. When Allah said, وَإِذَا بَطَشْتُمْ بَطَشْتُمْ جبارين. When you, O people of Ad, Sayyidina Hud said, you people of Ad, you are going mighty on the earth, traversing the earth and causing corruption and killing others. You know how big they were? How big they were? Allah gave them such power from birth that when they grew up, they became so tough that they looked at the mountain. And imagine they looked at the mountain and said, yeah, that, that, that mountain, that looks like a nice house for me. So they started to carve out, they carved out their house inside the mountain. And they lived in mountains. And they got to other, you know, they were so big, they used to make certain sculptures and certain idols and, you know, they used to put them on certain hills and certain mountains. And this is, this is these people who Allah gave this power to. Do you think anyone else is going to get this power ever till the day of judgment? Anyone's going to become giants like them? You know, a large tree that we've got here, they used to pluck that tree out of the ground like you would pluck out a weed out of the ground. Another way your weed grows, and you basically just take the weed with your hand and you pluck the whole thing out. They take a large tree of our ground and they're able to pluck that out of the ground. That's how much And then they got to the height when they thought, you know, all other people in the rest of the world, they're, they're midgets. <laughs> they're midgets. They're little ants for us. If you want to go and just step on them, we can kill them. We can kill them by stepping on them. So they said, they came when they made their statement. They said, Man ashaddu minna quwa. Who has more power than us? Who's got more power than us? Who can have more power than us? We are the most powerful. So Sayyidina Hud said, He said, Don't you see that Allah, the one who gave you this power, must have more power than you? Can you make that logic? So, how did Allah take those Jabbarin down? They were Jabbarin, the people who wanted to challenge Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal. Imagine how big they were, right? They were giants. What did, how did Allah take them down? Subhanallah, you read the Qur'an, you will find out. 
in Surah Al-Haqqa, Surah Al-Hamim and Sajda. Allah sent a wind. Okay? Now when this wind came, this, uh, today there was a bit of a storm. Did you see that? Did you see that storm about 1, 2 something? Yeah, 2 p.m. It was quite, quite rough. All of a sudden it came and you can see things blowing away. Now Allah can do that. Within seconds He can send the wind. So he decided to send them a wind within a moment. Now this wind is coming towards them, but it's so strong, it's blown so strong. When the wind hit them, Ms. Jabbarin, when the wind hit them, it was so forceful, imagine it did this to them, that the wind lifted the giants from the ground into the air. That's how forceful the wind was. It lifted them up, but it was so strong that when it when they came back down with the force of the wind and they hit the ground, they hit it so hard that their arms from the joints and their legs from the joints and the heads from the joint of the body just cracked, smashed, ripped open, and an arm of a giant was found over there. Another arm found over there, a leg found over there, another leg over there, his head's over there, and his body's over here. Allah says, and it, was just, it wasn't just like up and smash, no. Allah took them up, then He twisted them in the wind, right? This must be some kind of tornado, and He twisted them in the wind, and then He brought them down, crashing down, smack, and then their limbs were basically left, left separated on the ground. Allah says, Ajaz Nahlin Hawi. Allah says what? He says, the way if I took a, a date palm from the ground, and if I was to lift it up with the tornado, and twist it, twist the tree, and break it and crush it on the ground, the way that, that would have happened with his branches split, over a, a whole you know, ground, you know, in pieces, that's how I left their limbs on the ground. But then Allah didn't stop there. See, one wind, one big tone, one great tornado, within minutes Allah could have done this. No, He didn't. He let that tornado carry on spinning in their place for seven nights and eight days. Seven nights and eight days. Now, what does a tornado do? To it? Now, there's never been there's never been such a long one in the history of mankind. Have you ever heard of a tornado that's lasted for a whole week in one place and is carrying, ripping, tearing pieces and you know moving? Have you never heard, you've never heard of that. This this is this is history in the Quran. So Allah Azza wa Jal, why did he do that? Because what I believe is that the tornado after killing them would have taken the this dust and the sand and the houses and trees or whatever and carried on mincing them in pieces till it got to dust and then Allah settled it all over them which means what? which means that they're buried deep inside the ground deep inside the ground and there is going to be a day my friends when Allah will get some you know archaeologists that will come back and they will discover these bones. There's going to be a day when Allah will show their limbs that have been scattered. There will be a day. But this is what Allah Azza wa Jal did with those Jabbars. So, coming back to the coming back to the um, uh, the meaning of of uh, Al Jabbar. Imam Qurtubi says, and he quotes on Ibn Al uh, Ibn Al Ambari. He says that Jabbar can have many different meanings. One meaning of the Al-Jabbar is Al-Qahar, the one who will coerce others, force others. He will force others, show his might over others to make them do something. That's, that's one meaning of Al-Jabbar. Number two, the, meaning, the second meaning of Al-Jabbar is Al-Musallit, which means that he can, he can come as a force controlling them. He can, he can control them. Al-Musallit, one who has got such overbearing power that they, they cannot organize themselves to control themselves, but this controller controls them. That's one meaning of Al-Jabbar. And that meaning of controlling others, if you, if you want to find that meaning in the Qur'an, you look in Surah Qaf, the Surah number 50, and number 45, Allah has said, وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِجَبَّارٍ 
O oh Muhammad, I haven't sent you to the earth to become a controller over these people. You don't have, you, 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 your mission is not to control these people. You've been sent to Mecca and to the world to tell them about Islam, and tell them about the, about the message of Islam. But you're not a person who I have sent to control them. What does that mean? That means that you do your job. You just deliver your message. You get them to understand the message. That's fine. Leave them to accept the message. Accept the message, they have to accept it. You can't force them to accept it. You can't control them and your job is not to do that. Not that Rasulullah was doing that, but he, he really, really had a heavy heart that these people weren't accepting the message, and that's why Allah has to say, say that to him. So that's a second meaning of Al Jabbar. A third meaning is Al Qawiyul Azim Al Jism. That some, someone or a being who is great and great in its size. Great in its size. So. For example, if something is, something is a giant, then you know, you can call them Jabbar. If you want to find this meaning, uh, Ibn Lambari says that you look in Surah Ma'idah, the fifth surah, ayah number 22, Inna fiha qawman jabbarin. When Allah sent Musa alayhi salam and his people to go and to take over Palestine and the Holy Land, they came there and they looked and they saw these amaliqa, they saw these giants that were inside Palestine. So they said, they said to uh, Musa, he said, you go and tell your Lord to go and fight inside there because there's some giants in there, we can't, we can't fight them. Now Allah simply said to them that you walk in that city and they will walk out. I will put fear into their hearts. I will put fear into the hearts of the giants. Allah can do that. Yes or no? Yes, He can do that. Just like, you know, sometimes you're a giant, you're a giant, and a spider, a small spider, appears, and you go, ah! Have you not seen that? Some people, they see a small spider, the size of which they are a giant to the spider. But they're scared. <laughs> they're scared. You think, what? They're scared of a spider. How is that? That is Allah, he does, he does that, he, he can cast fear into you for a small thing. So for example, how do, how do you, how do you, if you think about Allah's Qudra, how do you as a small man, ride an elephant? There are people across the world, they ride elephants, yes or no? Yeah. Yes, you've seen that. I saw with my own eyes, a, a man riding an elephant, and he orders the elephant to, to get down, the elephant gets down, he jumps on the tusk, then he jumps on the head, then he jumps on the body, and then he orders it to get up, and he gets up, and he rides the elephant. What made this elephant fear this man? Because if the elephant just lifted his foot up, the man would have run, you know, already a mile <laughs> before he can fully put his foot down, you know. He's got that power, power but who puts that fear? Allah So he told the people of Musa, he said, you guys just walk in there. When they'll see you, they'll fear you, they're going to run. But they didn't. They said, you know, they, they, they did, and that's how they lost. And Allah said, you know, now you go to the desert and stay for 40 years. It's a long story, I'm not going to get into that. But the part of that is in Surah Ma'idah, ayah number 22. This is meaning number three. Meaning number four is, of al Jabbar is, al mutakabbir an ibadatillah. The one who is too arrogant to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. That is also another meaning of Al Jabbar. And if you want to find that meaning in the Quran, you look in Surah Maryam, uh, Surah number 19, ayah number 32, Surah 19, ayah number 32, and the, um, the, the verse says, Walam yaj'alni jabbaran shaqiyya. Sayyiduna Isa ibn Maryam, Sayyiduna Isa, the son of Maryam, Alayhi salam, he said that I've been born and I've got these qualities and Allah has not made me one who is too... Their jabbaran means what? I'm not too arrogant to, to, work, you know, to, make, to become a servant of God. There are certain people you meet, subhanAllah, they're too arrogant to bow down. You know, I don't know if you've ever, ever looked into the um, story. I, I read a whole the whole autobiography of um, Malcolm X. It's, it's a really good book, if you want to read it. By, um, I think it's by Huxley. Um, so if you, re if, you, if you get to read the autobiography of Mike, you know, Malcolm X, it's a, it's a wonderful book, wonderful piece. Very good um, English in there as well. 
One of the fascinating things I found about him was that he was, and this is, this is clearly you know, representing people like that, he lost faith in God, he lost faith, and he became a person who was imprisoned, and in the prison he was so fed up of his life, and what God, he, what he believed that if there ever was a God, he used to swear at that God. This is before he became Muslim. He used to swear at that God. He used to, you know, when they ever, in the, the prison inmates, if they ever brought the subject of God, he used to be the most foul-mouthed person about God. That F in this and whatever, you know, he would come out of his mouth. To the extent that he earned himself the name of Satan. The other inmates would refer to Malcolm X as Satan. Because of, the, of his, 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 way, his attitude towards God. And then somebody came inside the prison and gave him da'wah. And he accepted the da'wah. So he became a Muslim. But he said the most difficult thing for him now was to do what we do so easily. Now you've got to understand this. You know what we're doing every salah, subhanallah. If you read this passage in Malcolm X's book, it really makes you think, what are we doing every single salah? Because in Salah, you are, and, and, and I, want to, I want you to first understand what Malcolm X is saying. Malcolm X is saying that, I had to kneel and bow down to this deity. So, he said that was the most difficult thing for me to do. The most difficult thing. He said, I bent my knees slowly. Can you imagine? I bent my knees slowly and I put them onto the ground. Now he's still thinking, what is he doing? He's in his cell, in the, in the prison. And he wants to do sujood to Allah, but it's not, it's not easy. It's not easy. So he's bending his back slowly, and he's thinking, how am I going to put my nose and my, my forehead on the ground? Okay, I'll go far as this. Right? I'll go far as this. But then he, he, it took him, it took him a lot to break himself inside and to say, you know, no, nah, come on, I've got to do this. And he puts his nose and his forehead onto the ground. You know that, you know what that is? That shows that a man has no pride left. That I'm nothing compared to you. And I've given myself 100% into you. You are everything, I'm nothing. I want us, us to realize, you know when we go to sujood, it's a big thing. It's not a small thing. He's telling Allah that Allah, you're everything. I've given myself into you. My hands, my feet, my, my body, my, my, my you know, knees on the ground, my head is on the ground, my, my nose is on the ground, my brain's next to the ground. You know, you are everything. You've got my forelock in your hand. This is a big statement we're making by the sujood. So, you know, this, this ayah, Jabbar there are people on the, uh, you know, across the um, globe. They, they can't do it. They can't. They can't become a servant of God. You know, in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, once he um, read an he read an ayah in 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 front of the Kaaba, and he read it with such beauty, and the meaning was so beautiful. And you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he went into sujood, and the people the kuffar around him they went into sujood, right? But there was one guy who was, still, who was mesmerized by the process of recitation and about the whole verses. But he was too arrogant to go into sujood. So he picked up a rock from the ground and he put it to his head. That was his sujood. <laughs> that was his sujood. He's too arrogant. There are people like that. They're too arrogant to make the, the ibadah uh, or, the, or going to the worship of Allah. So this, this part you will find there. So this was the fourth meaning of um, Jabbar. A fifth meaning is which, which what I already said about the people of Ad, that they would go around killing. Batashtum, batashtum, jabbarin. This is in um, Surah Shu'ara 26 and ayah number 130. Right? So they basically, um, this is that meaning. And also you will find in Surah Qasas, Surah Qasas, um, Surah number 28, ayah number 19. إِن تُرِيدُ إِلَّا أَن تَكُونَ جَبَّارًا فِي الْأَرْضِ You know, this statement was made to, um, to Musa alayhi salam. And the person who made it was a non-Muslim, but he said, 
when Musa killed that Coptic, and the next day he came and found another argument that that um, soldier who was a non-Muslim said to Musa, he said, he said, all you want to do is you just want to kill on the earth. You're going to kill this. Ne- no, so sorry, not not the soldier, the, the person who he came to uh, a a to, and you know there, there was some confusion over over the matter. Not that Musa wanted to do that, but he was accused of this. But the meaning that Jabbaran fil ard is qatalan, which means you want to kill. So one of the meanings of Jabbar is to kill. And a sixth meaning of, of Jabbar is At-Tawil min al-Nakhli If you have a tree or something that becomes really tall, really big in size, it can be referred to as Al-Jabbar. And Imam Qurtubi has narrated um, you know, poems from Imru al Khais and others. And the meanings of this all comes to one which is that you know, sometimes you can get a grape that can become really big in size. You can, you know, in the Arab would refer to it as Jabbar, meaning that it's, it's an overgrown size, it's really big. So anything big can have the meaning of, of Jabbar. Imam Khattabi, he says that Allah Azza wa Jal, when He is Jabbar, what me, it means that He can do with His creation something of His, you know, either of His command or Him preventing them, He can do something with them. As a sultan, as a king, as one who is in might and power, as one who rules over them, he can do that and he can, he can compel them. He can compel someone to do something. That is the meaning of Jabbar. Also, because Allah is the one, Allah is the one that the, the poverty and the needs and the necessities of His creation, because Allah fulfills them, Allah amends their, their, poverty, you know, their, their situation of poverty. He amends and alleviates them. He puts them back together again. He provides them, sustains them in, in a way that you know, they wouldn't do without Him. That is now also the meaning of Jabbar, which means to actually amend. You know, something's broken, you put it together. That's what He does with the creation and therefore He earns His name Al- Al-Jabbar. He has His name Al- Al-Jabbar. Another meaning is that because Allah Azza wa Jal has the right to look down, has the right that He is muta'azim, He is great, and everything else to Him is nothing. It's small, it's insignificant. So Allah Azza wa Jal has the right to call Himself Al-Jabbar, which means that He is full of greatness. He's not negative at all. He deserves that. He is full of greatness. We're the ones that are so small in front of him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibn al-Hisar, he says that if you look in, in the Qur'an, you will find that the word Jabbar has fallen right in between Al-Aziz and Al-Mutakabbir. Al-Aziz, the one of might, the one who gives dignity, the one who gives power, and Al-Mutakabbir, the one who has the right to see himself as greater than everything else. That's al mutakabbir So in between that, in Asma'ullah al-Husna, in the hadith, al-Jabbar has occurred. And in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Hashr, the same thing has happened. So what does this mean? This means that the meaning of al-Jabbar we should give to Allah Azza wa for him being Jabbar is that he is mighty, he is full of power, and he is omnipotent, which means that he has the power to do anything. That's the meaning we should give him. And that is why, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to go into his ruku and sujood, one of the phrases he used to say, which has been reported in Ahmad, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Tabrani, Bayhaqi and so on, is, Subhana dhil mulki wal malakuti, Subhana dhil izzati wal jabarut. So, Subhana dhil mulki wal malakut, Subhana dhil izzati wal jabarut, which means what? That, He's in sujood, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is in sujood on ruku, and he's saying, You, O Allah, you are exalted and above and free from any blame or anything that is impure that has been attributed to you. The one who possesses the dominion and the one who possesses all things that are owned. You, O oh Allah, are much high and much exalted and much you know, high, free from any blame, anything impure attributed to you. The one who is possessor of dignity, izzah, and wal jabarut, power. The one who is 
you know, is possessor of power of might. You are that one. So, from this hadith, you understand, Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Husayn says that from this, you understand that Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, Rasulullah when he said this, the meaning of, of, of Al-Jabbar given there, or, or Jabarut given there, is of might and of power, and that, ha- that is the meaning of Al-Jabbar, that he's mighty, he is powerful. Even though you can say that Al-Jabbar is the one that can actually smash things, he can, he can, if he wants to smash anything of, of his, on the earth or the creation, you can give that meaning to Al-Jabbar, yes, but it's more appropriate that you give him the, the meaning of being mighty and being powerful. And this all comes back to one thing which is, that Allah deserves, rightfully so, to have the quality of being almighty, all-powerful, having the greatest of existence and the greatest of might, the greatest of power, in a way that no one besides him has any, any, you know, right to claim over that. So all others should subdue to his power. Another meaning is, uh, another thing that, that comes from this meaning is that Allah Azza wa Jal, He is, since He is powerful, He is in no need, this is a, a beautiful phrase here, يَسْتَغْنِي عَنِ الْأَتْبَاعِ فَلَا يَكْثُرْ بِهِمْ مِنْ قِلَّةِ وَلَا يَسْتَنْصِرُ بِهِمْ مِنْ ذِلَّةِ كَمَا قَالَ تَعَالَى وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌّ مِنَ الذُّلِّ Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Isra, He has said in ayah number 111, he has said he has no he has no one close to him due to him being low if he makes anyone close to him he has done a favor unto them if jibril is close to him it's allah's favor that allah made jibril close to him if allah makes muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam a close one to him. If Allah said, Ibrahim is my Khalil, and I consider him to be a metaphoric friend, not a real friend, but a, you know, one who you could, you know, the way you see a friend, that, you know, I give him that title, fine. But I do not do that, because I am one who is low, and I need someone, no. I do that as a favor unto them. That's my favor to them. So, Ibn Arabi says that, due to this, you can see the name Al-Jabbar. That Allah Azza wa Jal, yes, He does not need, He does not need any of anyone to follow Him or follow His commands, so that He can become greater because of Him having less beforehand. No, He doesn't become great because of you coming to Him. Wala He doesn't, you know. Okay, Allah has called the soldiers of Allah on the earth, the people who go and fight for Allah's sake. He has called them Hizbullah. He said, Ula'ika Hezbollah. We're not talking about the Hezbollah in, um, in Lebanon, alright? Please. No, I don't want the MI6 to now take me and be imprisonment because I mentioned this. This is a statement in Surah Mujadala. Allah says, anyone who is, who on his behalf is doing things for his religion, Ula'ika Hezbollah, they are the party or they are the, 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 um, the, the, the they're the group who are, who, who are on behalf of Allah. That's all it means, Hezbollah. They've taken that meaning for themselves. Right? They, I, I don't like it when people take these things and they, they put it for themselves. And if they get a bad name, then the Qur'an gets a bad name. I, I don't like that. But anyway, when I mention Hezbollah, I'm talking about anyone on the earth who, who Allah is using as his soldier on the earth. As his, you know, and his soldiers are not just men, please. His soldiers are the ants. His soldiers are the ants. If he wants to use them, he can use them. His soldiers, amongst his soldiers is the, are the winds. Amongst his soldiers are the mountains. Amongst his soldiers are the, are the, is, is the earth itself. Amongst his soldiers are even, you could say, a small fly or a mosquito. A mosquito, Namrud, a tyrant, a jabbar on the earth. Namrud, you know, he, he said, okay, if God exists, then I'm going to fight that God. Here's another Jabbar, a tyrant. So here comes Namrud, the Jabbar. And he says, okay, my army, he had a massive army. He said, okay army, come together. We're going to take our um, arrows and we're going to shoot them straight in that sky 
from where the revelation comes to Ibrahim. And he got his whole army out. And he said, come on! You call yourself Allah, God? You think you are you there? Well, if you're there, I challenge you. So this Jabbar challenged Al-Jabbar. The real Al-Jabbar. So he shot. And he shot. And he said, come on, come, come. Come and fight me. Where are you? So Allah Azawajal said, okay. <laughs> you want to fight? Let's fight. Let's fight. Allah sent down mosquitoes. <laughs> mosquitoes. <laughs> you know when a mosquito bites you, what are you going to do? You can still Allah. Allah, 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 Allah. Allah said, I'll send you a weak, a weak army of man. Go fight me. Go fight me. So he sent mosquitoes down. When these mosquitoes came, What's all this? Hey, 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 hey. There's so many, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them all over the place. The soldiers were running everywhere, were running, running. Right? They're running. And Namrud, you know, he's also running. But what happens is, you know, this is what does well. A mosquito's here, right? And, and he, he goes, he sniffs. <laughs> and the mosquito goes into his nostril. And Allah makes that mosquito survive. So that mosquito is now alive and is somewhere there. <laughs> Inside his, his head and onto his brain, somewhere by his brain. Right? And it's alive. So now what happens is, <laughs> this, this Namrud who's a tyrant on the earth who wanted to challenge Allah, he's got a living mosquito inside him and that mosquito is sucking blood. Every time he sucks blood, right? Every time he sucks blood, he needs some, he needs to, he whacks his head. <laughs> he whacks his own head. And when he whacks his head, then the mosquito stops and he gets a bit of relief. When the mosquito gets hungry again, he sucks blood, he whacks his head. Then now he's getting tired of whacking himself. So he told his, his soldier, when I saw he said, hey listen, stand next to me with this, with this club. <laughs> Every time I tell you. This is in this is in the Israeli riwayat. This is in the Israeli riwayat. Now, you know you can take benefit from it. So every time he gets he gets uh, you know this, this this really bad and and you know what what does a mosquito do? If somebody's not sucking blood, something you know if you have a mosquito and you're trying to sleep, what's the sound of a mosquito? Mm-hmm. Right? This thing's in his head. So it's going. Mm-hmm. And he's going, ah, and he's going mad. So he's telling this guy, don't hit me. So he hits him. Ah, oh, oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. And he, he rests for a little while. And he says again, when the mosquito boat, he says, hit me. So he hits him. This soldier is standing there. He's hitting now the king. He's hitting Namrud. And Namrud challenged Allah. So he's hitting Namrud. Now he's hitting him. Now this soldier, now days are going by. And this, this, this king is going mad. He's going insane, this buzzing sound, the sucking of his blood, you know. I want it. It's one small soldier of Allah. One small soldier of Allah. One mosquito. You say, you want to challenge me? Go on, I challenge you. You want to fight? Let's fight. I'll send you one of my soldiers. I'll see if you can take him on. If you can take him on, then perhaps you can move on to take some other soldiers of mine. Because you're not getting to me yet. So this soldier got so sick. You know, the, you know, the soldier is holding this club and he has to hit him. And he has to hit him. And he's saying, yeah, it's tiring to do that. Right? And each time he hits him, the buzzing doesn't stop until he hits him a bit harder. So now the, the wax are getting harder. Now this guy is taking a lot of blows on his head. Right? Because of this mosquito. In the end, the soldier thinks, you know, ah, that's enough man. Let me just give him one. Let me try and kill the mosquito. So he whacks this king and by hitting him so hard, this guy collapsed on the ground and that Jabbar is dead on the ground. Allah killed him. That Jabbar is dead on the ground. So you can now imagine, subhanAllah al um, Allah Azza wa Jal does not need anyone, you know, for any reason for him to, you know, for, 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 you know the, the hadith is, quotes, is quoted here by Imam Qurtubi that even if the whole of mankind, this is, this is one, one beautiful hadith, that we shouldn't feel in any way that we are doing a service for God, 
No, no, no. The service, the, you know, you might, you might be doing the ibadah of Allah, and you might get happy that, you know, I've served Allah. Now you shouldn't even have that. You shouldn't even have that. No, no, no. The honor is not your honor. The honor is Allah's honor. That He gave you permission to serve Him. Subhanallah. The honor is Allah's honor that He gave you guidance. The honor is Allah's honor that He never made you a tyrant on the ground. The honor is Allah's honor that He gave iman in your heart. The honor is Allah's honor that He made you come to salah. And the honor is Allah's honor that He made you go down to the earth and not made you a jabbar and shaqiya, one who's too arrogant to, to do the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. That is why Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah when he used to start his tahajjud, he used to, his first crying, he used to cry over the ayah, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ He used to cry over that. <coughs> Every night for tahajjud, he used to get up, and when he used to read these verses, he used to cry. Why? What is, what is إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ What is he saying? It is saying that you only do we worship, and you only do we seek help, from whom we seek help. He used to cry, why? Because he's thinking to himself that, oh Allah, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't even get up this night. So who am I to say to you that you only I am serving? Who am I to say that I'm serving you? No, the honor is yours, the dignity is yours, my Lord, for waking me up and giving me the opportunity to serve you. And that, hum- that, that used to make him humble and used to make him cry. And... Imam Qurtubi says that one of the things that you need to remember is that you make yourself this miskeen in front of Allah. And that's one of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Tirmidhi. Allahumma ahyini miskeena wa Allah, make me stay alive as one who needs you. Who's in need of you? Wa amitni miskeena. Make me, on, when I die, make me one who dies in need of you. Wa shunni fi zumaratil masakeen. And make me die while I'm amongst the group of people who, uh, sorry, when you resurrect me, make me resurrect on the day of judgment that I Come up amongst the people who need you. I, I want to be amongst always the people who need you. Not to feel that, that you know, you're the one who needs. Allah does not need anyone. So Rasulullah says another hadith, uh, and Imam Qurtubi reminds us of this is, a hadith and a dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, Allahumma fili khata'i wa amadi wa kullu dhalika indi. Oh Allah, you forgive me for my mistake, whether I've, for, for my mistake, whether I've done it out of mistake, whether I've done it purposefully, whatever I have done, forgive me. Wa kullu dhalika indi. But, and oh Allah, I admit, all of it is from me. You don't make me sin. If I, if I do anything wrong, it's, my, it's myself. And Rasulullah sallallahu is only saying this so that he can teach us to say this. Not that he sins, he doesn't sin. But he's only teaching us to say this and to humble ourselves in front of Allah Azza wa And there is um, uh, another, another long hadith, it's almost time for Maghrib, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he shows his entire, his entire, you know, uh, his... And, and he used to do this in many different um, ahadith, where he would show his entire desperateness to Allah Azza wa And Allah loves this. Where, you know, he would say to him words like, you know, Dao faquwati, my, my power is, is weak. Uh, Allah, uh, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa would say, Killa tahilati, you know, I, my plans are inappropriate that I can do anything with them. You know, you're the planner, you're the one who is, who is the powerful one. Ya Arham rahim and so on. So we're supposed to humble ourselves in front of Allah Azza wa Jal in this manner. And Imam Qurtubi finishes up by saying, It is, فَيَجَبُ ala kulli Muslim. It is incumbent on every single Muslim, on every single believer. Allah يَتَّصِفَ بِهَذَا الْإِسْمُ وَلَا That we do not take... We do not take this name for ourselves, that we don't call ourselves Jabbar in any way. We find that Allah is, Azza wa Jal, He deserves to see our tadhallul, our lowliness in front of Him, iftiqar, us showing our need and necessity to the lil malikil wahid il Jabbar, so that we show it to the true King, who is the one and only, and who is the mighty one. Alladhi ista'ala ala al mawjudat who has his power of everything that exists. وَقَهَرَهَا بَعْدَ أَنْ أَنْشَأَهَا And he has brought, he has compelled it after he created it. وَخَلَقَهَا وَلَمْ يَزَلْ مُسْتَعْلِيَا And he created it and he is the one who is still in charge and above all of it. فَالْخَالِقُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَرَبُّ الْعِزَّةِ وَالْجَبَّارِ 
He is the one who is the creator, the, 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 the Rabb and the Lord of dignity and of power and of might. الَّذِي يَبْتِشُ jabbarin, Who takes every mighty one on the ground with his grip and he will crush them and bring them down. وَيُهْلِكُ مَنْ شَاءَ كَيْفَ شَاءَ And he will destroy whoever he wants, however he wants. وَيَأْخُذُ أَخْذَ الْعَزِيزِ الْمُقْتَدِرِ And he will take them in a way that, that he will show his might and his power over them. وَلَا يَخَافُ الْعُقْبَى He does not fear the end of anyone who, who is in front of him. وَلَهُ الْآخِرَ and he is the beginning and the, and the end is all for him. And everyone besides him, Yastadif, should, sh- should try and ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give him the, the rahmah and his mercy. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, we, you know, we will see you next week for the next session on Al-Mutakabbir and other names. Jazakumullah. Mm-hmm.